Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first thank you for the opportunity that I have. It's an honor for me to be here, and I really feel uh, privileged to be here and to talk to you. But let me start by raising a question. Can we agree that man learns from history, but that mankind learns rather poorly? We over and over make the same mistakes. Uh, for instance, if we look at history, we see countries who have internal problems. And then the leaders, they seek for an external excuse so that they can strengthen the cohesion in their country. And this external excuse is most of the time called war. And when the war is over, we make peace. And then, when we make peace, those who lost the war, we see to it that they pay. Most of the time, there is no room for reconciliation in a peace treaty. And to me, a peace treaty without the basis of reconciliation is like a kiss of Judas to the future. Just think of the classical example that everybody knows, the Treaty of Versailles at the end of the First World War. We all know what happened afterwards. And when I talk about the future, then I think that we all can agree that our future will be totally different than where we are now. The world sees at the moment a balance shift, a shift in power. The world is changing rapidly, and it's changing faster and faster. And then a lot of people, when we talk about change in our world, will think about climate change. Now, I will not talk on that. You have worries enough about the fires in your country. But then a lot of people think about technical change. IT, cyber. We even call cyber with the same breath. We talk about a cyber war. And then we say that cyber and IT is a revolution. I don't agree. It's just another step in the evolution. We always talked with each other. We wrote letters. We sent pigeons up with a text at the feet. We did crazy things to communicate. We had lines to talk to the line, and then on the other side, somebody was listening in, and he understood what you were saying at far distance. Then we got radios, and now we have computers. It's just another step. But still, there is a, rev a revolutionary thing in this change in technology. And the real revolutionary thing is that you can't choose anymore to get out of the game. You all, even if you decide this evening to throw away your cell phone, when you come home, kick out the iPad, kick out the computer, kick out the laptop, you're still in the game. Because you will be in the data of the municipality, you will be in the data of an insurance company, in the IT world, you exist and you can't get out. For the first time, you can't choose anymore to be neutral or say, no, I'm not taking part in this war. The real revolution is that, yes, we can't decide anymore not to take part of what's happening. 
And another thing is that for Australia, your ocean will not help you anymore. And the only certainty I can give to you is that the uncertainty will grow. And in this faster changing world, I think that a lot of you are doing exactly the same as our soldiers when they are on the front line and under fire. A lot of you are trying to survive. Now, Thomas Friedman wrote a few years ago a book on that, The World is Flat. Did anybody read the book? Nobody? Yeah, yeah, you did? Okay, my respect, because then you and I know that the book isn't flat. That's why the others didn't read. I'll give you two things out of this book. The first thing that he says is that in this world, everything will come out in the open. So my translation is, if you think that you can hide away things, the only thing that you're doing is fooling yourself. It will come out in the open. But then on surviving, Thomas Friedman says that only a few categories of people will survive in a faster changing world. He talks about very special people and very specialized people. So these are the bosses of Microsoft and Google or a brain surgeon. Now I don't know if there's a brain surgeon in the room, but I don't think that we belong to these categories. But he mentions one category that will survive in a faster changing world. And maybe you belong to that category, but otherwise you can choose to become a member of that category right away. Because that category that survives in a faster changing world, he calls the adaptable. Now let's be honest. He just stole that from Darwin. We already knew. So be adaptable. And don't adapt blindly to the changing world, but do it with a lot of wisdom. But our world will change, it will be different. Our problems will be different. So our solutions probably will be different. And the world we know and the new technology-driven world that is coming IT, cyber, you name it, artificial intelligence, they will come together. And we all know that what man invents is used for the better and for the worse. And I'll give you a simple military example. You all know that there was a conflict, or still is, in Ukraine. And the U Ukrainian artillerymen, they found out on the internet that was a quite handy app that you can use. You as an artillery officer, you can do your math better with this small app. So the Ukrainian officers started to use this app. And it worked well. So they said to their colleagues, you should use this thing. This is a clever thing. And then when enough Ukrainians used this app, they got counter-battery fire. They were shot at at the location where the apps were used. That's the world we are in. In this world, protection is something different. In this world, the oceans will not help you anymore. In this world, borders will be less relevant. Well, I come from Europe. We have a lot of borders. But they don't stop crime. They don't stop terrorism. They don't stop migration, and they certainly don't stop cyber. So we are all more and more dependent on each other. And whether you like it or not, the international dependency will only grow. And I know that there are people who don't like that. But our challenges will grow too. And they are too big to tackle them on our own. So let us learn from, for instance, Nelson Mandela. 
He said on working together, cooperating, he said a wise thing. He said, if you want to have peace with your enemy, start cooperating, and the enemy will become your partner. Now, I do agree with you that South Africa is not in bad shape, of not in good shape, but they did become world champion rugby. <laughs> and I think of Nelson Mandela as a true leader. And in these changing times, with a lot of uncertainty, that's what we need, true leaders. But you all know that leadership starts by yourself. So do you regularly ask yourself the question, what makes me tick? What are my values? What are my ethics? What are my ideals? I call that your moral compass. Because you as leader, the leaders that we need, they set the right example. They are honest and clear, and they think on the long-term perspective and not only on the short-term perspective. They should be like soldiers, because soldiers don't only want to win the battle, they want to win the war. And you can see and mention the examples in the world yourself. You all see what is happening. Maybe we should think a little bit more about what a guy in Israel said. You probably haven't heard of him, Yehuda Bauer. He's a professor in the Holocaust tragedy. And he says that the Ten Amendments in the Bible, we should add three new ones. I'll give them to you. Thou shall not be a perpetrator. Thou shall not be a victim. And thou shall not be a bystander. So doing nothing is no option. You have to take your responsibility, all of us, but especially our leaders. Does that mean that you have to be perfect? Is somebody perfect in the room? Now, modesty belongs to perfection, so maybe somebody is too modest, and you know a colleague or a friend who is perfect, yeah? Nobody? May I then draw the conclusion that nobody is perfect here? And can I then also draw the conclusion that you can't do it alone in life? No, you have to cooperate. You need all the knowledge, experience, energy of others to reach your goals. And we soldiers have a terminology for that. We call that unity of effort, but based on the right moral compass. Because then, you can reach the thing that a lot of people talk about, but it's difficult to define. And we need it all, and that's trust. We need trust, and soldiers know how important trust is, because soldiers trust each other blindly. Because when you walk in an ambush with your patrol, everybody has to do what we agreed upon in advance, and otherwise, we are all in deep trouble. And soldiers know that trust is a two-way street. And if it, it isn't a two-way street, it's a dead-end street. Now, have you ever considered what trust is and how deep trust goes? I'll give you this, a small story. I'll give you what my opinion about the death of trust is. My son believed all my stories about the military, so he went to the military academy. And he became a platoon commander, boss of 40 professional soldiers. On a Saturday morning, his cell phone rang. He picked it up, walked out of the room, and he had a long, 
difficult and complex discussion on the phone. Why do I know that? I'm a dad, I'm a parent, and you want to know what they are doing. You know you're not allowed to do it, but you listen in. I'm human too, I'm not perfect. So when he comes into the room again, I honestly said to him, hey Dan, what was this phone call about? He was 20 years, 23 years of age. He looked me in the eye and he said, oh dad, that's one of my sergeants, and he's married, he has two kids, but he has no problems in his marriage, and he asked me for advice. That's trust. So deep goes trust. And you can only reach trust when in those moments you pick up the phone. They know that you pick up the phone and you are there for them. So you have to connect to get trust as a leader, you have to connect. Now, a lot of people think that connecting is stick out your hand, have a nice chat over a cup of coffee. That's not what I mean with connect. Now, connection means that you are prepared to stick out your neck for somebody else. Because then you will have the best guarantee that they will do it for you too. And if you don't have a good connection, you're not willing to make a good connection, things can go wrong. And I'll give you an example where I'm still ashamed of. We, the Dutch Armed Forces, went on a mission to Iraq. And in Iraq, the army guys came up with a request to the Netherlands. And do you know what the soil, well, most of the part in Iraq is? Sand. And the army guys in Iraq, they sent a message to the Netherlands and they wanted to have that three crates of sand coming with highest priority to Iraq. You've got it? Three crates of sand immediately to Iraq. And yes, the army guys in the Netherlands, they filled three crates with sand, put them on a truck, drove to the military airfield, freight ladder, highest priority, now immediately first plane to Iraq. Can you imagine what the Air Force was thinking? Bringing sand to Iraq? But no army guys to explain. And no Air Force asking questions. Because if I ask a question, everybody would laugh. And if I put the, these crates with sand in the plane, that everybody would laugh for decades on me. So nobody made the connection. And the sand didn't go with the first plane. It didn't go with the second plane. And then the army guys got nervous. Oh, wait a moment. We better explain why we need this sand. Has somebody a clue where the sand was for? Any idea? No? On the encampments where we live, the army drills water holes. And deep down in these holes, the water has to be purified with a specific kind of sand. Sand that you can't find in Iraq, but you can find it in the Netherlands. And this sand was in these crates. And because the crates not coming with the first plane, we had to drive with truckloads full of crates with bottles of water to our encampments. We had to drive through, through riskful areas because nobody explained and nobody dared to ask the question. So if somebody asks you to come up with sand, ask the question. Connect, because that's what you should do. That's leadership. And leadership in good times, that's easy. But leadership in what I call the moments of truth, when things go wrong, things are going badly, then that's the proof of the, the proof of the eat, uh, eating is the, sorry, the proof of the pudding is the eating. Leadership, when it goes wrong, then you have to be there. And I'll give you the most profound example in my life. One day, big festi uh, festivity in the Netherlands, 
General Pieter van Uum takes over from General Dick Berlijn, and we have a new CDF, as you call it. So my wife and I, we stayed in The Hague, and we went to a hotel, the officer's hotel. The next morning, I kissed my wife goodbye, stepped for the first time as CDF in the car, and the driver, after good morning, was totally silent. Okay, can happen, silent guy. Then I came into the ministry. Nobody was there in the hallways. Hey, that's strange. They start not specifically early in the ministry. So I walked to my office, and there was my deputy. A good fellow, a comrade for many years. I knew him, a good Air Force colleague. And immediately I saw on his face that things were wrong. Things were terribly wrong. And I immediately knew there's something wrong with our troops in the missions. You don't think of your son. But then my deputy told me that Mark Schouwing, soldier Mark Schouwing, the driver of Lieutenant Dennis van Uum, they both were killed by an improvised, uh, improvised explosive device in Afghanistan, and the two other soldiers were badly wounded fighting for their lives. I can tell you, then your world falls apart. Now the deputy said to me that my son was sitting down in an armored vehicle. And I told him, with this story, I'm not going to my wife. And he thought that I was in a state of denial. No. I talked in length with my son how to be a leader of an infantry platoon, and that you don't sit somewhere deep down in an armored vehicle. You are at a position where you can see what's happening and you can guide your soldiers. So I said to my deputy, make a check. I'm not going to my wife with this story. I sat for 20 minutes in total misery on my desk. And then he returned with my director of operations. And they said, Peter, you're right, but it is your son. So I had to go to my wife just 10 minutes drive away, the worst 10 minutes of my life. When I came into the room, she said, hey, Peter, you forgot something? No, darling, I forgot nothing. And I had to tell her that we had lost our son. Then I had to explain to her that we had to get in the car Grab your stuff, we have to go because we have protocols. The minister will be informed, the minister will inform the government, and then we have a press conference, and then it's on the telly and on the radio. So we had to drive to our family to explain to them what had happened. In the car, we had to call our daughter and the partner of our son because they were both abroad. And the message was simple. This has happened. Get on the plane, come home. In the evening, our house was crowded. Friends, family, they wanted to be there for my wife and me. And at a point of time, my wife just couldn't cope with it anymore. And she said, they have to go. I, I need time for, for, for myself, for us. So I asked them to leave. Within 15 minutes, they had cleaned up the house, all went, and they had put on the television. If you think that my wife and I were watching the television, then you're totally wrong. We were sitting on the, co on the couch holding each other, and I said all the wrong things. My moral compass shook and was heading for the wrong direction. And then the biggest late night show in the Netherlands starts. And they showed a picture of the driver and our son. So we start watching. And they started a discussion on whether I still could be the chief of defense. And they didn't only have an opinion, they had a judgment on it. And I got furious. Who are you? 
You don't know me, you don't know my soldiers, you don't know my own. Who are you to have an opinion, even a judgment? And because I got furious, my wife got furious too. And that took us out of our, our grief. And we looked each other in the eye and we said, if they on the television are right, we not only lose our son, but we will lose everything our son believed in and where we believed in. This is not going to happen. So the two of us the same day decided that I would go on. I didn't know if I was capable, but at least I would try. We knew that the two girls who were coming home had a decisive word in this, but they luckily supported us. In the days that we were arranging the funeral of our son, I saw a few things that I didn't like. In the media was a discussion on what are we doing in Afghanistan. And they had the discussion from the angle of the two soldiers that were killed. But I was raised with the idea that if the Allies in the Second World War would have asked themselves the same question, then the Netherlands would be totally different. So I thought this is a wrong angle for the discussion. You can have the discussion with me, but not in this way. In the ministry I heard there was a lot of unrest because on the telly they were saying that the chief is going. And I could imagine how our soldiers sitting around the campfire in Afghanistan were talking with each other. They are just normal guys and girls. They lost two colleagues, two mates as you call it. They weren't sitting around the campfire and saying, let's do a patrol, a riskful patrol for several days to help the Afghan population. No, they were blaming the Afghans. Their moral compass shook as hard as mine did at the couch at home. But I was responsible. I had to do something. So I decided against the advice of the Ministry of Defense to hold a press conference. And I organized it in that way that the soldiers in Afghanistan could lively follow and see what I said at the press conference. In the press conference, I said that we are doing the right things in Afghanistan and we are doing it in the right manner also. And we should go on helping the Afghan population. And these guys who laid that bomb, yes, we tried to catch them. I also said that I will go on as chief of defense. After the press conference, I went to my minister and I told him that you've heard now what I said, but if you think that I'm not up to the job and I don't perform well, don't feel sorry for me if my family, just tell me and I will retire the same day. But those 70,000 soldiers, they deserve to have a commander that is up to the job. Now, within a few days, the discussion in the media slowly went in the right direction and maybe I contributed to that. There was calmness, rest in the ministry. Oh, the chief stays. A few weeks later, I again went to Afghanistan to visit the troops. This was a strange trip. Young soldiers, young sergeants, lieutenants, holding me by the shoulder, standing in front of me, nodding. And some said, sir, what they did to you and your family and what you said on the press conference, we will make it happen. Their moral compass was again in the right direction. If you deal with your responsibility in this manner, you can make the difference. Thank you very much. Thank you.